Thanks a lot, Chris. I am truly honored to be here. It is such a wonderful conference, and I'd like to thank Petta and Rita and everyone who's involved in putting this together. It's really a tremendous gathering, and I'm completely inspired and learning a lot. I'd also personally like to thank Stan Groff and Richard Tarnas, either of which whom I would not be here today to be able to present this information to you. So um, my heart goes out to them specifically. Um, and briefly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by reading just a little bit. I'm going to lay out some of the basic fundamental details that we need. And then I'm going to explain some concepts. And then I'm going to read a little bit more. And then I'm going to explain a couple more concepts. And then I'm going to leave a good 10 minutes for questions. I'm going to try and unpack all of this in 20 minutes. So let's get started. I imagine most of you know, but for those of you who don't, Stanislav Grof was a pioneering LSD psychotherapist in the late 1950s and 1960s and is one of the founders of transpersonal psychology. After heading the last legally funded LSD research in the United States at John Hopkins Medical Center from 1968 to 72, Stan moved to Esalen on the Big Sur coast of California to become a scholar in residence, where he later developed hol holotropic breathwork with his late wife, Christina. Richard Tarnas, after graduating from Harvard with an undergraduate degree in history, moved to Esalen in 1974 to work with Stan and to write his PhD dissertation on LSD psychotherapy. For nearly 20 years, Stan had searched for a psychological test to assess the radically different experiences people could have from one LSD session to another. He wondered why two people in similar settings on the same day could have radically different experiences, one potentially a rapturous experience of bliss and the other is our, and spiritual breakthrough, while the other person could have an experience of overwhelming sense of suffering and dying. He tried the litany of psychological tests, um, none of which provided any satisfactory insights. Until one day in 1976, when a student of the workshop and Stan's, one of Stan's workshops came through and suggested that they look at transit astrology uh, to assess what the archetypal complexes are that were informing one's experience. So in the interest of thoroughness, they decided to investigate, and to both of their astonishment, transit astrology far and away surpassed any previous investigative tool for illuminating the archetypal content emerging from an individual's unconscious and the precise timing for when the certain archetypal dynamics would be activated. This insight led to the realization that one could time their therapeutic sessions to align with the most favorable transits to support particular modes of healing experience. Um, so just to highlight, this is basically what I just said. And uh, in addition to the timing and uh, the quality of the archetypal content that was emerging into, into consciousness, it also, illuminated the archetypes through non-ordinary states of consciousness with a clarity unhindered by egoic filtration. Now, what, what do I mean when I say that? And what, do, what are we really saying that archetypal astrology allows us insight into the depth of the psyche and the spontaneous or the um, emergent unconscious material? So what seems to be happening in any non-ordinary state of consciousness experience is the ego is dissolved in a certain way. It's not as present, it's not as in control, it's not as much of a director of the filtering. One becomes a more vivid embodiment of one's archetypal complexes because the ego isn't repressing or directing the unconscious content that is arising into consciousness. Think of Jung, previously mentioned in both of the earlier talks. When he went through his midlife shamanic descent, his ego wasn't as in control as it is normally, and the archetypes ran through him in ways that allowed him to recognize the autonomy of the archetypes themselves. And it seems as though something similar is happening in non-ordinary states where the archetypes can come through in a more vivid expression without the filtration of egoic um, consciousness. So. Um, Who's familiar with the perinatal birth matrices? Just a quick raise of hands. 
good, lots of you. Okay, so basically what Rick recognized when they were doing their early research is that each perinatal matrix um, corresponds specifically to the archetypal content related to the four outer planets. So in the first matrix, um, Neptune, I mean, the, the undifferentiated unity in the first state is correlated to Neptune. The archetype is of transcendent, of the timeless, of the unitive dimension. Um, in the first matrix, if it's a good womb, the mother is in love and uh, supporting the nurturance of the child, it's experienced as bliss. It's experienced as a timeless um, holding of nurturing where one is just growing. And then um, upon first contraction, the second matrix began. And until the cervix dilates, um, one is stuck here in the second matrix. And it feels like all of the shadow dimensions of the archetype of Saturn. Saturn has plenty of tremendous, wonderful things. But in the second matrix, you really only experience the, the shadow dimensions, which are guilt, shame, um, the sense of failure that you've been cast out of Eden, where you felt like you were in heaven, and you've been pushed into hell ultimately and you, you don't have a, a, there's no exit. There's no way to escape the situation. So until the cervix dilates, it's a highly constricting, constricting and contracting experience. Um, but when the cervix dilates, there is motion, there's light at the end of the tunnel, there's still tremendous forces that are propelling the fetus through the birth canal and it's a life and death struggle. But there's motion and there's even a sense of hope potentially that the re there will be resolution to come. And um, that all correlates to the archetype of Pluto, the deep, the transformative, the cathartic, um, the evolutionary principle of life and death. And um, the fourth matrix corresponds to Uranus, which is the actual birth, the liberation, the breakthrough into new horizons, the sudden, unexpected new reality that presents itself upon birth. 50 years earlier, uh, Swiss psychologist C.G. Jung began developing the theory of synchronicity in the late 20s, but did not publish his ideas on the concept until 1951. From 1932 to 1957, Jung carried on a nearly 30-year correspondence with the theoretical physicist Wolfgang Pauli. In their lengthy letters to one another, they discussed everything from Pauli's dreams Jung had analyzed to Pauli's desire to find a neutral language that would inform both psychology and physics. And most importantly, they were in dialogue surrounding Jung's development of the theory of synchronicity and the parallels and coherence it has with quantum mechanics. Okay. So this is um, Jung in a letter to Pauli in 1948. He says, quite a while ago, you encouraged me to write down my thoughts on synchronicity. I finally managed to get around to do it and more or less collect my thoughts on the subject. I would be most grateful if you would be kind enough to cast a critical eye over it, covered as it is with question marks. I hope I am not encroaching too much on your valuable time. Your opinion in this matter is so important to me, I have cast aside any misgivings I might have in that respect. Thank you in advance. Yours sincerely, C.G. Young. So Karen Barad is a contemporary theoretical physicist who has studied um, Niels Bohr very deeply. And she says this about quantum mechanics. She says, indeed, quantum mechanics is the most successful and accurate theory in the history of physics, accounting for a phenomena over a range of 25 orders of magnitude, <clears throat> from the smallest particles of matter to large-scale objects. Quantum physics does not merely substitute Newtonian physics. It supersedes it. And so there's a lot of understanding that people misunderstand that quantum mechanics is the science of the micro world and Newtonian or, or I mean, relativity is science for the macro world. That's not actually the case. Um, quantum mechanics is a much more highly accurate um, science. I can, I'll say it this way. Quantum mechanics can measure the distance between New York and LA to within the width of a human hair. But why do you need to know that? You don't. Like, um, it doesn't help us launch satellites around planets or shoot Tomahawk missiles into somebody's window and wherever. Um, that's Newtonian mechanics that we use. But if we wanted to do it more precisely, we would actually use quantum mechanics. Um, so entanglement. There are two concepts in quantum mechanics that I want to have us come away with. Entanglement and the principle of complementarity. So entanglement, Nobel laureate Richard Feynman describes it this way. The double slit experiment 
is a phenomenon which is impossible, absolutely impossible to explain in any classical way, and which has in it the heart of quantum mechanics. In reality, it contains the only mystery. Now I'm going to explain it in about three minutes. So let's see how this goes. This is the double slit experiment. This is with one slit, and this is with two. And what happens with two, when you have two appropriate place slits, the, the light goes through and it diffracts. It's a, this is an interference diffraction pattern, and the particles are interacting with themselves, and they're amplifying, and they're canceling each other out. And another way to see this is with waves. So like this is um, two waves, and you see that um, they are amplifying in the center. This is the strongest position, and they cancel each other out in between. So there's, a, there's an amplification and a neg negation pattern that's taking place, and this is called diffraction. And this is what happens in the um, lab when scientists do the double slit experiment. Um, they shoot electrons through these two slits, and what happens is when we don't look, when we don't have a measuring device that, shoot, that is able to see which path the electron goes through, it does this. It creates a diffraction pattern, unlike what we would think that particles would do. And they've, they've actually done this experiment with one particle at a time. And it still creates the diffraction pattern. It's not, you don't even need two. It'll do it with one. It's really insane. But then, when we look, for, when we put place a measuring device just before or after the slit, the, pro car, the particle actually behaves like a particle. Um, it seems as though it knows on some level that it's been seen and therefore behaves like a particle. Right? Yeah, it's crazy and hard to understand, like Feynman said. But it gets weirder. Um, in the last 20 years, they've done experiments called quantum erasure experiments, which they actually can erase the information that they collect. So they'll do this experiment. They'll have the measure device in multiple ways where they collect the information, and they know that they have the information. And the pattern is created like this. You get the, what you would think when it is, knows it's been seen. But then what they do is they erase the information before someone has looked at it to know, and what happens? It reproduces the diffraction pattern afterwards in time. So there is an overlap in time, and there is an entanglement relationship between the electron and human consciousness. Now, we can't say necessarily that the electron is conscious. I don't believe that's a, that's a bit of a projection, but what we can say is that the electron behaves in a way as such that it is aware of our awareness of it. So I believe I can say that, and I feel confident in it. I need to talk to some real scientists and know, but anyway, this is Stan, and I'm gonna, um, the, this is a great quote from him. Listen, right in the middle, he'll mention Niles Bohr's principle of complementarity, and uh, what follows after that is really important, so please play. We are fields of consciousness, transcending time and space, having no limitations, transcending linear causality. You can experience it in meditation, you can experience it in spiritual emergencies, you can experience it in the breathing, you can experience it under hypnosis, in the trance state, you can experience it when you take psychedelic sessions and so on. So what we have to do now, because we know those things are real, a person can be dying and consciousness detaches from the brain and they would go and perceive something in the other part of the building. Blind people can see in an out-of-body state and so on. So what we end up with is some kind of strange paradox, a paradoxical definition of who we are. And that definition will be very strangely similar to what physicists like Fred Wolf came up was in relation to subatomic matter and also light. And that is the wave particle paradox. Subatomic matter is particles and waves at the same time. Light is photons or electromagnetic waves. In different experimental arrangements and the different circumstances, sometimes it's more appropriate to think about what you're seeing as photons. In some other experiments, it's more like light. And uh, Niels Bohr, who tried to solve this paradox, came up with what's called complementarity principle. In order to understand what light is, what subatomic matter is, you have to simply accept a paradox. Those are two complementary aspects of the same phenomenon. And you, 
No matter what you do, you will not get what Einstein always wanted, which is a visualizable model. You can really pin it down. Say, what is it? I mean, a particle is occupying a certain space, has a certain momentum, has certain coordinates. Waves are spread all over the place. So, and your brain is saying, you know, is it a particle or is it a wave? It cannot be both. Only this is the best we can do. This is the best we can do, it seems. So there is definitely a paradoxical nature to reality. This is um, Bohr's principle of complementarity, and it basically states that the wave-particle duality is complementary dimensions of the same phenomena, um, and that we can't know both particle and wave at the same time. And the key insight that really wasn't mentioned in the last bit, and what comes out of the principle of complementarity, is that it actually destroys the idea of the subject-object division. Um, what happens is that the act of measuring something influences the measured object to a point that you cannot know what the object is without your impeding on its existence. Um, so what is, you, and, or another way to say that is you cannot remove us as observers from reality. Um, when we, the act of observation itself is a participatory process and it is co-creating the reality that we see. So we're not actually separate, we're embedded, we're in, in interaction with reality. And this is what um, Karen Barad has recognized. Uh, I'll go back to this, those are just statements confirming how important the principle of complementarity is by other physicists. but. Barad came up with the neologism interaction to define it. So she says, the neologism interaction signifies the mutual constitution of entangled agencies. That is, in contrast to the usual interaction, which assumes that there are separate individual agencies that precede their interaction, the notion of interaction recognizes that distinct agencies do not proceed, but rather emerge through their interaction. It is important to note that distinct agencies are only distinct in a relational, not in an absolute sense. That is, agencies are only distinct in relation to their mutual entanglement. They do not exist as individual elements. So this gets us to Richard Tarnas's archetypal historiography. In Cosmos and Psyche, he uses the four outer planets to sh demonstrate how um, cultural phenomena in history al aligns with the alignments with the outer planets and correlates to the archetypal nature of their complex interactions. Um, I, in reading that book, I just picked up a little bit of what in the Jupiter Uranus chapter about quantum mechanics that he mentioned, and I delved deeply into it, and what I recognized is that many of the f scientists who are involved in founding quantum mechanics have Jupiter-Uranus in their natal chart, or Uranus-Pluto, and then when they had their major discoveries, Jupiter and Uranus were in the sky or in alignment with their natal charts. So it's a mutual interaction, a, um, an engagement where the archetypes that are in present in the sky are activating and um, the natal configurations. So. This, what we're looking at, is um, a timeline created by Kyle Lymatter. It's the Archetypal Explorer program, which you can get online, and um, which is it's actually very personal. You can use your own personal transits and stuff, but this is just a, um, a, a worldview look. So what we're seeing here is from 19, 1895 through 1930, and these are, this is the conjunction, I'm just gonna use my hand. This is the conjunction, this is an opposition, conjunction, opposition, conjunction. And this is the founding of quantum mechanics. Max Planck founds quantum mechanics in October of 1900. Um, the interpretation of dreams is published right at the turn of the century, right at the beginning of the jupiter uranus conjunction. And then in the opposition, the rydberg ritz combination is what allows them to um, recognize the frequencies inside the orbital shells of atoms. It's what does spectral analysis, if you've ever seen that, and it's incredible. But it, it fulfills Niels Bohr's model, the atom, which he comes up with during the next opposition. And um, 
then Ernest Rutherford discovers the proton. At, I'm sorry, that was a conjunction. At the next opposition, Ernest Rutherford discovers the proton. This is also when Einstein's um, theory, general theory of relativity was validated. There was an eclipse, and they saw the bending of starlight around it, and he instantly became the most fi famous scientist in the world, eclipsing, eclipsing Newton's um, sense of gravity and with the full new revelation of it. But then at the next conjunction, we have... Um, Niels Bohr's principle of complementarity, the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, the Davison-Germer experiment, which actually confirms that electrons are waves, that, that matter has wave-like properties. So it's not just, um, well, it's a combination. So, and then it's at the Fifth Solvay Congress when this takes place, and it, is, it solidifies quantum mechanics as a legitimate science even though it, it contains uncertainty and unpredictability. And this is where Einstein had a real problem, uh, just basically saying that it was an incomplete theory. And Niels Bohr and himself went back and forth on it for many years. Um, so it, here's another, wait, let me get back. Um, this is another way you can look at it. This is the Uranus-Pluto alignments, which the Jupiter-Uranus alignment's like a 14-month alignment. Um, the Uranus-Pluto alignments are more like a decade to 12 years. And what we see here, this is from 1895 through 1945. And not only did we get the founding of depth psychology and quantum mechanics, but the discovery of X-rays, radioactivity, the discovery of the electron, um, the Einstein's general, um, I'm sorry, special theory of relativity. And it's also um, Albert Hoffman is born in 1906 right here. And, um, then in the 20s, this is when all of the really major important um, experiments were done in quantum mechanics that solidified it, made it, um, they knew they were on the right path. And then at the end, right here, 1927, this is the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction that I mentioned with the Fifth Solvay Congress that solidified it as a legitimate science. Then in the square, all the particle accelerators begin. Um, the, the first fission, and, and what's interesting is um, nuclear fission and um, the discovery of LSD happened within a year of each other. So what led to the atomic bomb in physics and what led to the atomic bomb in psychology were actually created and within a year of each other during the Uranus-Pluto square of the 1930s. And then the sextile is a shorter acting, softer alignment, but it's actually when Hiroshima and Nagasaki took place. Now, I could go on. Um, this is like the st uh, standard model of particle physics is the 60s. This is also when Stan was developing the perinatal theory um, with his LSD work. Uh, this is the sextile, which they found, they discovered the top quark. It has to do with the standard model. This is also when the Higgs boson was predicted. Um, and in this, it's interesting, uh, the founding of the PCC program um, which was the first reintroduction of astrology into higher education since it was eclipsed back in the 1700s. Um, so this is our current decade, and what's really fascinating is that we built the Large Hadron Collider, which is the most um, complex, largest machine humanity's ever made, and they did it specifically to find the Higgs field. And the Higgs field is the last piece of the standard model of physics that we're looking for, and it allows everything else to gain mass. Um, like every um, elementary particle that's inside the atom, as it interacts with the Higgs field, it's what allows it to gain mass. Yeah, they, it's, it was an incredible event and um, a completion of 30, 40, 50 years of research. But here's the point. I think we can recognize these as diffraction patterns. The planets are both particles and they're waves. They're waving in time, and these are probability density waves. In the same way the Schrodinger equation describes a probability density point to, for finding the electron, these are probability density waves where we're more likely to find phenomena associated with the archetypal complex related to the two planets or multiple planets involved. And that doesn't mean that you won't find evidence in between. It's not a hydraulic situation, 
but you're more likely to see, and this is what Cosmos and Psyche really demonstrates, is that you're more likely to see archetypal phenomenon associated with those planets when they're in hard aspect alignment. So this is poly on synchronicity just prior to the, oh, I'm going over time. I want questions. Okay. Sorry. Um, what should I say? Basically, he, Polly is saying here um, the type of statistical law that comes into being, one that is not reproducible by individual cases, which acts as a mediator between this continuum of individual cases and the continuum that can be realized approximately in large scale statistical framework may be described as a statistical correspondence. And I think that's kind of what's happening here. We're potentially moving into an objective, a, a slightly more objective way of seeing ourselves because there's so much personal bias involved in analyzing a personal birth chart or biography. But when you look at broad sweeps of time and cultural history, um, there's a lot less subjectivity involved. I mean, we have history books written by historians who have no idea about the archetypes, that they'll use the archetypal language to describe the events. So my point basically is that these are diffraction wave patterns that are amplifying the differences and highlighting um, the, the potentials of the archetypal complexes, and they're, and they're there for us to see. Um, and this will be probably, I have one more, but this will be the last thing. I really want questions. Indeed, recent studies of diffraction interference phenomena have provided insights about the nature of entanglement of quantum states and have enabled physicists to test metaphysical ideas in the lab. So while it is true that diffraction apparatuses measure the effects, difference, and even more profoundly, they highlight, exhibit, and make evident the entangled structure of the changing and contingent ontology of the world, including the ontology of knowing. In fact, diffraction not only brings reality, brings the reality of entanglements to light, it is itself a phenomenon, uh, it's an entangled phenomenon, sorry. So, last quote, Nietzsche, in concern for our disconnection to our roots of history due to the severing of that really from the Copernican revolution. He said, direct self-observation is not nearly sufficient for us to know ourselves, colon. We need history for the past flows within us in a hundred waves. And I think that's, I mean, another way we can see, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. But we, we can see the past in us, in waves, and this is a way of um, a new level of objectivity of being able to see ourselves in self-reflection. That's basically what I wanted to say. I think there's a lot more I could say, um, but, and yeah, this is from yesterday. I'll just leave it at that. I think there's, we could go on forever, but thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chad. We've experienced here the, the, the phenomenon that time is different when you're on the stage <laughs> than when you're right here. But we have maybe a couple of minutes for just a couple of questions. And there's lunch, and I, I'll answer as long as you yeah. guys want to stay. So, yeah. Or as, and as long as they are into it, too, because I don't want to, yeah. Hello, and uh, thank you very much sure. for this uh, highly interesting talk. I wanted to ask you if you are first familiar with the concept of morphogenesis or morphic resonance of Rupert mm, Sheldrake, sure. mm -hmm. and if yes, um, how do you uh, account uh, or how do you integrate this concept into um, what you My guess described? is that they're actually really similar. Um, I mean, I think the, the basic um, conceptual piece that I'm working with here is entanglement. Um, and entanglement seems to be demonstrated at the smallest levels of matter that we that exist, um, the electron. Like you think about neurochemistry, we change our neurochemistry with chemicals and it changes our consciousness. But what's happening on the edges of those neurochemicals? They're electrons. They're electron shells that are doing the information exchange bordering on each molecule. So. If the electron is demonstrating consciousness, potentially, or awareness of us in a relationship responsive, 
then why is that not the case through and through without through without with through with reality and I think morphic resonance would potentially move in, uh, fall in line and or you know b be similar in that way but I don't know enough about it to really say clearly yeah um you have the microphone yeah, yeah just one last question um in relation to archetypal re uh, archetypal astrology um I really don't, it's a technical question, I really don't know how to calculate my personal chart against what's happening right now. So just as an example, I was born in 65 and I have Uranus, Pluto, Venus, Mars and Mercury all in the ninth house. So uh, my question really is, and my last years have been very rocky of course, so my question really is how do I technically bring these things together? How do I, when I want to plan a psychedelic session for instance, how would these things come forward? Well, how, how um, can I do there's it? There's a couple of answers. I mean, the, get a good reading from a good astrologer, one that knows about if you're looking for um, timing of, of sessions, one who's been educated through Rick and Stan, I would recommend that. But then there are multiple astrology programs that you can get just to calculate your own personal transits. And... Um, reading, like um, the Archive Journal that Becca is the editor of on Cosmos and Psyche, um, and just follow the path. You keep going as deep as you possibly can and um, checking it with your own experience. And it takes a lot of rigor and imagination because it's a poetic interpretive process, but, and you can get carried away, but um, there's also ways in which we can check our understanding with others. Um, this is where I think there's a level of objectivity returning to astrology because we can see history in a way that we can't see individual biography and it actually allows us a new perspective on the whole picture. But that's just a hypothesis and we'll see. But is there anyone else? I'm going or? to ask that we take the other questions at a personal level after the gathering. I want to appreciate the way Chad dances his knowledge. Isn't that lovely? <laughs>